This episode of the Party Loaded Podcast is proudly sponsored by Audible.com. Check out their awesome catalogue of audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from. And be sure to grab a free audiobook on us and support the show by visiting audibletrial.com slash endgame. Let's party. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back for another episode, another week of Party Loaded. Uh, My name is Luke Ritalik. It is the evening of Wednesday, the 17th of January. We've hit that mid-month of uh, summer for us, or have we? Uh, I've got uh, Jam and Ollie joining me right here in... um, We're back in apocalypse weather territory, guys. What's going on? We've just been caught in rainstorms. Jam, you got a freaking cold. It's the middle of summer. What the hell's going on? Climate change isn't real, people. That's not new for me, but... Um, I had to wait through puddles on Monday and that wasn't fun. So. Oh, good. Yeah. Bleh. Yeah, seriously. Anyone who says climate <laughs> change isn't a thing, fucking look at Australia right now. Jesus Christ. Well, we had photos going up everywhere <laughs> of like simultaneous bushfires and, uh, you know, yeah. torrential downpours. It's like, what the hell is yeah. going on? <laughs> the East Coast melted. The mm. West Coast got rained on. Yeah. yeah, exactly. In the middle of summer. It's sodden. <laughs> So Australia's I, like a microwave, like it's hot and crispy on the outside and still frozen on the centre. <laughs> my shoes my shoes on Monday dried just in time for me to walk back home through the puddles, so that Yay. was great. Oh, Jesus. Right. Hence the cold. Mm-hmm. Well, perfect weather for anyone who has been uh, caught um, inside to be playing some games and doing some stuff. Uh, mm. So pew, pew. Yeah, we've been playing a few games. Let's, let's talk about some some things we've been playing. Um, Ollie, let's throw to you first tonight. What have you been up to this week, man? What's what's going on? I've been playing not Resident Evil DLC like I said I would, ah. but that's He's okay. Liar. I know I'm Lied the worst. Um, next week, mostly because <laughs> I've been playing other games. So because I'm sort of wrapping up a bit on Destiny, I have decided to branch out into other games recently. Um, so I decided to give Warframe a try because I've heard nothing but good things. Mm. I watched a couple of videos on it and read a few bits and pieces on it and everything I read was glowing. So I'm like, all right. And I, and the best, best part is it's free to play. So at the end of the day, it's a zero investment. So if Just I don't like it, oh well. Time Just is that money. delicious time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Meh. What's you're, you're Value your time, moment. Oliver. <laughs> you are worth it. <laughs> well, Ollie, Ollie has not gone back to work yet, so I fully understand where this is yeah, coming from. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Oh, yeah. Give me give me a little while, then I'll be like, nah, my time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've tried Warframe out. I tried it with Jam. Mm-hmm. I think we tried mm. it on Sunday, question mark? Yeah. Yeah. I played Sunday. a little like bit hour? of this as well, but not as much as you guys, because I had uh, internet trubs that kind of distracted me a bit. So, uh, you'll yeah, no doubt so have you- a much more informed opinion than me. Well, yeah, we played a whole hour, um, <laughs> if maybe a tiny bit more, I think. So, yeah, we tried it out. I immediately liked the visuals. Mm-hmm. I was also immediately deafened by the menu, but that's okay. That happens yeah. in every game. Mm. But the visuals are very nice. It's a very pretty game for its age, actually. Yeah, so for a free it's, game. it's aged very well. The visual style helps a lot. I enjoy the little fragments of story. Mm-hmm. Some of the voice acting is really bad, but that's okay. <laughs> I can forgive it. But as far as I can tell, it's basically a loot grinder shooter done really, really, really well. I don't know if it's my type of game yet, question mark. Like, I enjoy being Iron Man mixed with ninja, with a ninja. That was quite cool. Mm-hmm. Jam loved stapling people to, or staking yep. people to walls with a bow and arrow. Yeah, that was fun. Mm-hmm. It's definitely um, fun. But I 100% agree with what someone else said online which was no matter how long you're logged in for as soon as you've done like a mission or something every time you play you achieve some form of progress okay whereas other games you can do like a mission and you get nothing worthwhile Mm. and you don't progress whereas this you always make some form of progression the other thing that i immediately love immediately is the online marketplace is it's not chests. It's not like, oh, you get a chance of opening these. It's not packs or anything like that. It's just, oh, you want that skin? Yeah, you buy it. Done. Hmm. Immediately a thousand times better. Like, that was always my pet peeve with Overwatch. I always wanted to be like, I just want this one skin. Yeah. I just want this one. I, I know that's how they make their money. But at the same time, I was like, 
I just want the Bastion skin because I'm a terrible person. So, question and on that: so, is, is this a is this a real world um, currency enabled marketplace, or is this purely just in game currency? Both. Okay. Hmm. So you can buy it with in game currency. You can buy it with IRL monies. So you can grind for your gear. Mm-hmm. You can pay money for your gear, or you can unlock it via the quests and, and just it, play the game. Is it linked to the Steam marketplace as well, where you can buy things outside of Ooh, the game? Club? I. I don't know enough about that. Sorry, I only clicked on the one that's in the ship. Gotcha. Um, okay. And had to browse through that. Hmm. So, I'm also not too sure about the distinction because there's two types of in-game currency. One which yeah. we seem to be getting an abundance on, and the other one we don't, which seems to be what's used for the nicer stuff. Right. Yeah. So I think so it's I'm very not clear on how much you can use with in-game currency. So it's a bit. It's a bit like the glimmer slash legendary shards. Yeah. Exactly yeah. like yeah. that. It is yeah. exactly glimmer versus. Um, Bright like dust. silver, I guess. Bright dust, yeah. yeah in yeah. Destiny. Silver. So yeah, I enjoyed it. I wasn't like blown away or anything like that, but I did enjoy it. I'll probably go back to it in some point. Hmm. But yeah, what did you guys think, Jam? It was a gigantic meh for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not remotely invested. It was a bit of fun, but I have not found my thoughts returning to it at all. <laughs> No, that's fine. It's yeah, it's not my kind of game. There doesn't seem mm. to be much of a payoff. It's just too grindy for me. But I suppose if I have a few friends playing because I've got it installed and it's free, I might mm. jump back on occasionally. <laughs> I don't see myself spending any money on it. Mm. Mm. Okay, I have one question. Mm-hmm. One question only. Why would you say it feels more grindy than Destiny? Uh, Destiny <sighs> rewards me in other ways. Such as? There's puzzle elements to it. Shax does not count, by the way. Shax <laughs> counts. Sh- shut your face. <laughs> Shax is bay, and I won't hear you say another word against him. Um, <laughs> there's a beautiful story element to it. There's fantastic graphics. It rewards me for exploring. I love the puzzles of the, the raids and the strikes and the social okay. element there uh, and the achievement you get from doing a difficult thing in a well-coordinated manner with a group of friends is why I still enjoy Destiny, even though I've maxed out. Mm. Mm. See, now, from my research, all of that is in this game as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but I can't see it. Mm. That's because you played an hour. <laughs> you play yeah. an hour of Destiny, you don't see half the things you just saw. That's true. I Destiny see. really does start at the end game after you finish the story. Like That, that is a very yeah. different game from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I'm devil's advocating here. I'm not saying your fun is wrong. I'm just saying. So the in thing its I enjoyed the most out of Warframe was shooting minion <laughs> in the head and having him fly backwards and up to be skewed on the ceiling, hanging above his buddy who had no idea I was there, and that made me giggle. <laughs> that does sound cool. <laughs> but other than that, the only other thing that surprised me was when I figured out how to open the lockers. <laughs> the rest was just. Yeah, it's- it's, it's yep, not very okay. intuitive at times. Whack, whack, whack. Cool. All the bad guys are dead. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What about mm. you, Luke, in your limited try? Um, well, I just used the default um, character selection, which I, is the one you described earlier. I think all three cool. of us did, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, cool. And, yeah, I mean, the impression I got uh, very early on was that this game is like... It's like running around in Destiny with your super always active. Like <laughs> you're just popping your your super abilities like over and over and over again. So you feel very powerful. Mm. The the general gameplay mechanics um, seemed quite good. Um, seemed the thing that really strikes me about Destiny is that before all of the extra stuff layered onto it, and you know, regardless of whether you're talking about Destiny one or two here, the game just feels like a phenomenally sh- smooth shooter. It's the one thing that really appeals to me above all else. It just feels great. Mm. Warframe doesn't quite feel the same click for me, but all of the extra stuff that exists in this game does look quite appealing. So, I think the grind, whether the grind is appetizing enough for me, will come down to whether that core gameplay loop outside of all of the bonuses feels satisfying enough Um, because you can layer on you know every which way to Sunday like different layers of gear and color and customization and this that and the other and that stuff's great but if the core gameplay doesn't feel great as a shooter that's the thing that keeps you coming back more than anything I find personally so yeah yeah. why do I want a pretty new skin on my guy and grind for hours to do it just that I can wear it while I grind more yeah, exactly. Like, there's no other, there's nothing else pulling me at the moment. But yeah. granted, I've I mean, only spent an hour in it. 
Yeah. You also I have to describe this. the faction rally in Destiny. No, <laughs> shut your face hole. <laughs> Just I have putting not. it out there, sorry. <laughs> it's got all these neat challenges for me to do to unlock my ornaments, and I'm going to look pimping, and you're going to be jealous. So you're, you're grinding for jealous. your cosmetic? Okay, cool. No. Playing just, fun things with just friends. Just clarifying, you know, just clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Just because you're sour on Destiny at the moment. I'm not <laughs> sour. I'm just... <laughs> I'm happy with my cosmetics, so I don't need to grind for more cosmetics. <laughs> I'm max light level. Uh, no, I mean... Anyway. I, I think I think it's a good time <laughs> to be looking at Warframe anyway, because when it comes to Destiny, we have done a lot of the stuff, and we've still got a few yeah. things to do, but I certainly don't feel like I need to spend the same time in Destiny at the moment to make the most out of, you know, progression. Um, yeah. I can split my time a bit more um, between that and, and other games, and Warframe looks like a lot of fun. I think I'll probably play a little bit of it and get my head around it. It does seem like a very dense game, like there's a lot of complexity yeah. that you can see in it from the get-go, and I really do feel that it's one of those things that will feel infinitely better to play once you understand a bit of that complexity and you don't feel overwhelmed by it sort of just coming straight in and you know more powerful characters with more abilities and more customization and that kind of stuff as far as the gameplay options go always feel better to play because you're tinkering and tailoring it to suit how you want to play so i think and better controller support yeah, oh, yeah. Jam was on controller. <laughs> yeah, well you just need to start playing pc games with your keyboard like god intended no 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 like God in <laughs> Jesus. Uh, no, but no, it, it looks like fun. I, I, I'm enjoying it. I'll uh, I'll play around a bit more with it. I mean, and it, a lot of it is off the recommendations of others because this game has got a serious amount of good press going for it at the moment. There's been yeah. uh, a lot going on. Yeah. I have literally not read a single bad thing about it, which says a lot in today's environment. Wait, let me type something. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I will say one bad thing about it. I noticed that uh, the the abilities that you pick up at the very beginning of the game, which are um, uh, uh, linked to your number keys, mm-hmm. you can't remap those from what I've seen, which was a little bit annoying. So he can, can you? It's are in you the sure? Game. Yeah. yeah, I tried to do that and I couldn't work it out. Anyway, maybe I'm just being a dumbass. It's twenty eighteen. Click on it and, and, it, and it says out press menu. the button, and you press the button because I did it on controller. All right, let's put that one down for the Lucas. Anyway, speaking of a game you definitely can't play on controller, <laughs> they are billions. Why can't I Luke? play it on controller? <laughs> because it doesn't have controller support. Damn it. Um, at least not that I know of. <laughs> Apologies if it does. But yeah, Luke and I have been playing a bit of this game. So it, I went from our friend Dave going, oh, you should play it, Ollie. Go on, Ollie, you should play it. Go on. I'm like, okay, all right, I'll give it a go. No, no, no. Eight I started off by encouraging later. everybody to play this game, and then Dave picked it up. And Yeah, but uh, Dave peer pressured me. Yeah, that's because he, he is freaking addicted to this game. Like, I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> I've played eight hours, in like two, and I bought it yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. So you, yeah. you can instantly see the appeal. <laughs> yeah, it's a really fun game. It's so <laughs> for those of you great. that are unaware, They Are Billions is a steampunk-flavoured zombie RTS base builder game. Yeah. That was a mouthful. It's, it's a roguelike um, RTS, I think, is probably a good yes, way to describe it. Yes, roguelike RTS. Yeah. So the premise is you're building a colony that's all steampunky and cool, and there's zombies everywhere, and there are a lot of them. <laughs> um, so you're building Billions towards a fact. set. <laughs> yes, it's in the name. You are building towards a set horde day countdown. So say 80 days, 100 days, 120 days, and so on. Yeah, yeah 100 and days or less if you're not a pussy. Just, uh, just putting it out there. <laughs> Oh, okay. snap. <laughs> sure. I've actually Luke's seen the whole text tree. I don't know if you have. Yeah, I have. Um, <laughs> oh, slow. Keep going. Mm, okay. Um, so, yes. <laughs> I really like this game mostly because it's a very unique take on base building because most RTSs you go, I expand, I expand. This is great. Yep, lots of resources coming in. Sweet. You're balancing out your workers versus your energy versus your food versus all your other bits and pieces, which is kind of cool. And it's not like too much mm. resource management. I found it just the right amount of resource management. But what it does very neatly is if you overexpand, suddenly you have all these borders you need to protect. Yeah, And that's where things get complicated because there are roving hordes of zombies. The occasional odd one dribbles in. You get mini hordes coming in. And so, yeah, you have to tread this fine line of cautiously expanding your base whilst maintaining its security. Because... Your buildings have men in them. And if the zombies kill those buildings, they get the men. 
And so it very quickly mm. snowballs oh, once yeah. you start losing buildings. That is the biggest so, difference yes. between a standard RTS and this, I think. Because if one solitary zombie gets through and manages to infect one of your um, your population sort of buildings, oh. like a, a tent or a, a village um, sort of uh, cottage or something like that, you are fucked. Like it, the infection yeah. spreads rapidly. And unless you've got a backup plan or you've segmented off your... Um, your base into different pockets that you can defend from, then it is game over really, really fast. So, Jeez. yeah. I had a few games that snowballed like that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm feeling good, feeling good. Oh, like <laughs> 10 zombies broke through. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, God, I don't have enough soldiers to deal with that. Oh, they just killed those. Oh, there goes a the building. There goes a... The... Yep, that's game over. It's, it's oh, the one God. game that when you see zombies coming through and you see the path they're going to be taking, the thing you do is hit pause and you liberally delete every building in their path so that they don't yep. actually get to it and spread more. You can't, really? do that within a, you can't do that within a certain proximity of them, though. <gasps> no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're clever like that. It's really crafty how they've done that. So, mm. yeah. Crafty how they've stopped you from cheating. Well, Basically, it's not, yes. It's not stopping you from cheating so much. It's a mechanic <laughs> that implies an, an extra... No, it's it, controlled demolitions. Yeah, it is. It's, <laughs> it's actually a strategy in this game. It is totally not cheating. Tactical it is something, retreat. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You you want to remove their yeah. food supply, basically. It's what you're trying to do. Oh. Yeah. This is a game that pausing is your friend. Like, you can actually... Oh, my God, yes. Yeah, you, you can pause and set up your build queue. Like, you can, you know, set any of your buildings to be constructed or deconstructed or any of your soldiers and that sort of thing. You can't move troops around while the game's paused, but um, it basically pauses all um, troop movement, including the enemy, which allows you time to pause, check what, where the risks are, regroup your thoughts as to what, how you're going to deal with it, and then just, you know, take it a step at a time. Um, because it is a very strategic game game it is not just a horde uh sort of game that some rts's can generate you know degenerate into when there's a lot of assets on the uh on the screen this one is one that you need to be very accurate um when you're playing because one slip can cost you the game in like a minute it's yeah it's awesome it is a game that kicks you in the nuts so hard Mm -hmm. and you just want to keep coming back for more because it is so challenging in a, a really fun way so yeah so for each of you what was the mechanic that lost you your first game or you go early. <laughs> that you, like, Me? failed to focus on or whatever. I just didn't have enough soldiers. I was like, oh, okay, this mini horde, it's only a mini horde. That should be fine. It won't be the big one. <laughs> this number of soldiers will be fine with, you know, like, this crappy wooden wall and some a couple of towers. I'm like, that's fine. Yeah. We'll be, re- oh, God, that's a lot of zombies. <laughs> nom, nom, waka, 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 waka. <laughs> it's essentially what happened to my base. Yeah. I okay. think I only, yeah. To put in perspective for those who have ever played the game, my initial score for my first game was 197. So not great. Yeah. Not mm. great. How many days was that? I have no fucking idea. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So I've been playing at the 100-day game, which is the um, one down from hardest difficulty. It's what's labeled as challenging. The, yeah. yeah. Um, I play on the 120. Okay, so it's just slightly less challenging. Um, the, yeah. the other setting as well is you can actually toggle how much zombie population starts on the map when you begin the game, and that mm-hmm. basically forms roaming pockets of zombies. Oh, they don't roam so much. They're kind of just in pockets that you need to eliminate before you expand out to those areas. It and also affects the mini horde size. Yeah, yeah, like when the waves come towards your base, they do pick up yeah. a few as they come through. So it, what one tactic that I've been um, getting onto recently, and this is a risky one because you really need to sort of pay attention to what's help, happening elsewhere on the map at the same time, is to actually have like a death squad of, uh, you know, fighters that you take out of your base and go on patrols and actually just try and wipe out as many of the straggling zombies as possible. It's a good way to um, sort of uh, step some soldiers up to veteran level um, so that you've got better fighters when the hordes come. Um, but you, you're kind of just th- thinning the hordes so that when the hordes do come, there's less to deal with at the same time. But it splits your attention and splits your focus, which is why it's a bit of a risk. You've got to be careful that you're not neglecting other areas of your, uh, your build queue and your base defense while you're doing that. So... Yeah, but man, this so game what, is just so fun. <laughs> what tripped you up on your first game? Uh, the two things that have been costing me games the most often, I usually lose the game very quickly in the early um, game when I'm focusing too much on scouting out my immediate area to work out where I'm going to expand to and where I'm going to set up my bottlenecks um, and uh, defenses around those bottlenecks because you kind of use the natural terrain to your advantage to plan out where you're going to defend from. And often what, what I'll do is I'll send out a few troops because you get a very small handful to start with before you actually get a building that can produce more. I send out my troops to kind of scout those areas and, and plan out where I'm going to move to. And as 
as I'm getting that build queue started, all of a sudden there's one gap in my defense that a single zombie comes through and then it's game over before I've even started. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, but the other thing as well is that I've realized very quickly that you actually want larger fronts to defend like I think it's actually better in this game to have a, a large um, wall sort of you know walling off a big section of the map between Build drain points instead of having like lots of small areas to defend because the way that the horde hits your base is it's very concentrated and you kind of want to have it hitting areas where there's lots of soldiers defending that you can draw from other towers to kind of you know build up your uh, your defenses whereas it, right. if you spread out to like small pockets of resistance they're, they're going to overcome a small pocket you need to like attack them across big fronts basically i mean so. okay. i'm gonna beg to differ i'm just putting a screenshot jam in the skype chat for you to see <laughs> that is a <laughs> horde that i versed and you can see it is not just in one place look how much red is on that yeah that, that's a that's a <laughs> later mm -hmm. game shot i've put a few of these up on my twitter as well so if anyone wants to take a look you can you can check that out but yeah i yeah, mean it, it's challenging you you do get a heads up when a, uh, a mini horde is progressing across the map you sort mm. of get a an icon on the mini map um which uh, sort of indicates the general direction that it's approaching from but the problem is that general direction doesn't always tell you in time exactly where it's going to hit and you sometimes have to scurry to get extra troops um, yep. at wherever it lands on your wall so yeah, you, you double layer everything. Like, you build layers of defenses in front of layers of defenses, and you retreat the fuck away when things get a bit too hot. It is, uh, it's a frantic game. Like, it's it's one that actually, you, you know how when you play Player Unknown's Battlegrounds and it gives you that, that real sense of sort of uh, survival suspense as you're running around and mm. hiding in bathtubs to try and not get shot through windows? This game kind of does that in an RTS sense because you have that palpable sense of fear and... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, anticipation when you know these hordes are coming because you just don't know how it's going to play out. Like, you could have the best defenses you could possibly muster, and it's still one mistake will cost you. So, you've got to be absolutely confident that you've got all your bases covered. Otherwise, you just don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, man, it's okay. Yeah. It's good. So, Mimo, it sounds like you should be playing this yeah. when you listen. <laughs> play this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I am, my um, <laughs> record at the moment is not great. It's only 56 days on my 100-day setting. What was and, the score? Oh, I, I forgot to take note of the score. I was paying attention to the days more than anything. So, I think I screen capped it, actually. I'll probably refer back to it later. But, uh, yeah, like I was, I was getting up to some pretty impressive military, but, again, concentrated horde hit my wall in just one particular spot, and it was just like popping a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. yeah, but man, what a game. It, I do have <laughs> two minor gripes with it. I won't sort of talk too much longer about it because we've got to move on. But two gripes I have with this game. Number one is that you can't um, change the scale on your minimap. I think it'd be really good if you could zoom in or out on your minimap. And the fact you can't do that kind of annoys me a little bit. And the second thing is that the terrain, um, unlike a lot of other RTSs, the terrain doesn't go transparent when there's stuff hiding behind it. So you can often have terrain obscuring your view completely to your own troops or zombies that are hiding um, sort of in the shadow of it, which is just Can you rotate super camera? No, you can't. What you can do is you can hold down the alt key and it actually shows everything's health bars and that becomes a bit more visible. But yeah, the fact oh. that you can't rotate camera and you, you can't see stuff through that terrain is a little bit of an issue. I, I think... Yeah, if, I'm gonna, if I was going to give the developer feedback, that would probably be the major point I think they need to address because that's not a super difficult fix if they, they yeah. implement it. And it is there. in beta, it should be noted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So, apparently they're going to be making a campaign mode and potentially multiplayer as well. Potentially multiplayer. Multiplayer would be really interesting in this game. Like, whether you're working cooperatively or, like, independently to try and split the hot that'd be so cool. I would play the hell out of that. Yeah, for sure. I think that would get me playing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's fun. So Can I be the zombie? Can I <laughs> like attack Luke? Because oh, that'd man. be sweet. If a player actually controlled the <laughs> horde, holy crap, that would be difficult. Yeah. I'd be creeping around looking for a gap in your defenses. Yeah. They're, actually, I got caught out way in one game. The, the zombies actually have uh, uh, sort of uh, villages or, or settlements that they have taken over, which are part of the terrain on the map. And if you come close to one of these things and you start trying to attack it, it basically just spawns hordes and hordes of zombies. Like, it, it's kind of like yep. a... Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, do you open the, the force and they come out. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I was like, oh, there's a city. And immediately Dave's like, don't go near. I'm like, too late. I shot with an arrow. Oh, I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yep. They are billions. That's how that game was lost. Worth a look. Yeah. Uh, 
Anybody been playing anything else? We we did finish the Destiny Raid a second time this week, which was a hell of a lot quicker and faster than the first time once yeah. you've done it once. Mm-hmm. Pop the cork on that and it seems like what, Turns we, out, what were we worried about the whole time? <laughs> knowing what you're doing makes a difference. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. That was good. I, I was a little dirty in one way because uh, a friend of ours, uh, Adrian, who's just recently started playing the game, um, he basically got to see all of the raid content and finish the raid in one night when we've actually done the hard yards and played it for months. <laughs> so it felt a He's little a cheating. good listener. He follows instructions well. Yeah, sure, sure, that's it, yeah. Mm, it helps. <laughs> it helps a lot. So the faction rally started Not today, which got me very excited because I'm looking to get every single ornament on the new monarchy outfit. Mm-hmm. Um, a pledge for the second time. I am dedicated. Um, mm-hmm. And, yeah, otherwise... I haven't played so much during the last week because I haven't been well, but mm. still having fun, still enjoying it, still want to try that raid layer. We haven't done the raid, raid layer. Yeah, I'm very curious for that. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Very check curious. it on the weekend. And, mm. and as much as I'm poo-pooing the, the ornaments and stuff like that, the Warlock one for New Monarchy does look very cool. Mm-hmm. Like, my only shame <laughs> is the New Monarchy, Monarchy one, Titan one, looks a bit naff. The Dead Space one looks a bit naff, and the... Future Warfare one looks okay. Mm. So War cult. Warlocks easily get the coolest looking gear yeah, in the game. Yeah, we're pretty. Like, without even trying. We're so uh, pretty. I don't know. I reckon Titans have some pretty pimping looking stuff. They do have nah, some pimping stuff, but overall outfits, Warlocks shit on the other two <laughs> classes. <laughs> and pro- got... Props to Adrian as well, who managed to craft himself like through the combination of the gear that he, he assembled. Like the coolest looking heavy beetle warrior outfit I've ever yes. seen. Yes. He so looks good. awesome. He does love his Beatles. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry, Jan, what were yeah. you saying? I was just going to say, I've got the full New Monarchy armor set now, mm-hmm. and I've unlocked one of the ornaments. But I realized after going through the Nightfall that I need to be wearing the full New Monarchy set in a Nightfall to unlock one of the ornaments. So now oh, I'm going to do that. No. Whee! <laughs> That's fun. But That's a- that'll be fine. Someone will need to do it over the next week, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure mm-hmm. we'll jump in. It is that time of year at the moment where we haven't had any of the major new releases yet. Like, I think different to 2017, around this time we had last year, uh, Resident Evil 7 had come out because um, I think that was a first week or two release in 2017. Whereas I think the only big thing we've really got on the horizon for January for anyone who's interested is uh, Monster Hunter World. And most of the other big sort of notable releases are sort of February, March. March, there's a crazy period of March. March which I is going to be, nuts. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's a good chance for us to sort of, you know, touch on some of the games that we've neglected um, in the last part of last year or, you know, just tinker around and play, you know, stuff like Warframe. And yeah, it's a fun time. I, I quite enjoy having mm-hmm. a little bit less pressure to check out new things. So yeah, it's good. I'm a little more interested in the roadmap that they've announced for the Destiny 2 stuff. Mm. Because apparently in Feb we're going to be able to see each other on the map, and that is amazing. <gasps> oh god, yes! <laughs> because today again I had to say, "Where are you? <laughs> Which way did you go?" Because I just you just lose people it's so easy. But it's exciting seeing all of the the stuff and how how they want to sort of rebalance the end game so that's a little more fun and enjoyable. I have to admit, I didn't look at it too closely, but I did not see mention of a new raid in there. Am I wrong? No, you're right. I think we've got the second expansion hitting around, I think it's February. I could be wrong about that, but I suspect what will happen with the second expansion is we'll probably see another raid lair type edition, and then maybe we'll get a full new raid when they have the first big um, sort of content drop. Looking at how Destiny 1 went, they sort of had the... um, what, what was the first expansion they had? The the Dark Below or the Dark Beneath or something like that? That was kind of uh, the equivalent of yeah. what we've been seeing. And it wasn't until Can't they remember. did um, <laughs> the uh, the Taken King that, you know, things really stepped up with the content. And that was like a major release for the game as opposed to just like a um, every few month expansion. So um, I would expect we'd see something similar on the Destiny 2 roadmap. It's obviously too early for them to release any info about that yet but um mm. this is a game they can to continue supporting as the you know games as a service model they're, they're gonna have things on the plan they won't you know you reveal know everything right now but yeah what i want them to do mm. just as a surprise to everyone just chuck in the old raids yes. just be like hey we polished them there you go run amok because i mean they've been crafted they exist mm. Mm. just just that'd be cool I'll, so I the think- people who haven't experienced it can experience it I think they've improved greatly. I love, I love the um, Callus, the, the Leviathan raid mm. 
more than any other raid I've played because it has such a huge focus on teamwork and it doesn't look like it'll be easy to, you know, magically smash one man someday, like some people manage to do with Crota and whatnot. But yeah, yeah. It's still revisiting those would be a lot of fun. I would I go a step further and say just bring in some of those old zones. Like Yeah, you yeah. just unlock them. Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, you used to ride around on Earth down here. There you go. <laughs> go explore. That'd be that'd be cool. Yeah, absolutely. Strikes even. Just, I mean, mm. the content's there. Um, it would add a lot of enjoyment. I think it makes sense and for them probably to space quite it out, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, it, I mean, people would probably be a bit up in arms, though, if they just expanded the game and put all the old Destiny content in in one hit. Like, they probably want to, like... I guess pace it a bit, maybe have a bit of it every so often That's with assuming other they totally do at new all, stuff as well. But yeah. yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be the way to do it. Like I... polish up a chunk, throw it in and say, surprise, we love you. Yeah, <laughs> people would be for it, I think. I mean, even Destiny 1 players, um, I don't think would be too against it. it. You know, it may be familiar, but it's still extra content for the game. So anything they can do to build it out would be good. But yeah. yeah. I don't know. Um, their, their big pressure from the community seems to be really scaling back on the Eververse content. So, you know, a lot of the um, the customization items um, that are in game, uh, anything that has any link to gameplay at all, people are just not fond of. Um, and they want it to be a bit more even handed in terms of what's available for customization. So I think they learned mm-hmm. during the dawning, especially when they actually segmented the dawning items into two different types of boxes, one of which can only be paid for with real money. Um, that that was, you know, met with a bit of backlash and probably rightly so. So, yeah, hopefully they find a better, more amicable solution to, to that. But um, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of haters out there. You still see a lot of uh, chat on, you know, various different places online that's, uh, you know, very doomsaying and uh, and very, you know, salty about where Destiny is going. But at the end of the day, it's a fun game. If you enjoy it, you'll sink time into it. If you don't, you'll find something else to do. So haters going to hate, yeah. basically. Yeah. And I, most of the complaints I tend to see are from Destiny 1 players as well, I've just got to say. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know what that means. Mm. But, uh, yeah, the um, the other exciting thing that happened during the week, and I was curious to see if you guys saw it or, or what you thought of it, was um, the rumoured Nintendo Direct that we spoke about last episode actually did happen. But it wasn't quite the scale that we expected. They held um, what was termed by them a mini Direct. And I think Nintendo's usually pretty good at... Um, being clear about what they intend to do with these directs. Like usually when they announce them, they'll say we're having a Nintendo direct on Pokemon, you know, in the future of our next few Pokemon releases. And you know, that that's what it's going to be about. They're not going to surprise sort of, you know, shoehorn any other stuff in there. That's not what they've said is going to be on there. And same with the mini direct. I mean, they, they basically said, you know, we're going to present information on a few games we've coming out, got coming out in the near future. There's not going to be any, you know, massive titles there. So we're not going to see any Metro prime four announcements or mainline Pokemon stuff or anything like that that but what they did show is a few interesting things so um apparently dark souls is actually gonna you know hit a nintendo platform for the first time ever and it's (laughs) gonna be on switch (laughs) so ollie as the dark souls player amongst our crew what do you think about original dark souls hitting switch do you have an opinion on that i mean i think it's good that they're going for a older audience now so because Let's be fair, Nintendo tends to be aimed towards the younger demographic in general. I know a lot of adults still play their games, and they're very good games, not saying they're not. Yep. Um, so I think it's good that they're having a more mature player base focus. Mm-hmm. Well, not focus, but expanding out into that direction. I think it's necessary as well. So Because then you can be like, Daddy plays these games, and then little Timmy plays these games on it, which is good. Yeah. It's a remastered version of Dark Souls as well, and apparently the remastered version will be available for other platforms at the same time. Um, It's coming as a May 25 release, so, um, Mm. yeah, it's pretty cool. It's going to be unforgiving of Dark Souls. It is the hardest out of the the three? I'd say it's the most unforgiving, not necessarily the most hardest. Okay, so the most dickish about screwing you over. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, A game called The World Ends With, uh, uh, With You is coming to console as well. So um, apparently that was a DS game uh, that launched in 2008 and was quite popular uh, upon release. But I don't know a lot about it. Um, So people plenty excited about that, though. Um, Mario Tennis is coming to to switch with a story mode it's <gasps> kind of interesting <laughs> and apparently uh luigi is actually going to p- appear in super mario odyssey so he was you know notably omitted from the game when odyssey launched um but he is going to be coming in a uh an addition to the game like an expandable uh um, sort of thing that's coming with a balloon world mode so 
Um, I don't know what the balloon mode is. It seems like a competitive kind of mini game, almost similar to how you've got the uh, the Mario Kart mode with the balloons on your carts where you have to pop each other's balloons to sort of mm-hmm. win the round. I don't know how that's going to work in um, Super Mario Odyssey, but uh, yeah, Luigi's going to be kind of the poster child for, for that mode, which um, seems interesting. So yeah, there you go. Um, cool stuff coming for Switch. And there's going to be another Nintendo oh, Direct oh. tonight as well, which is going to be more sort of... Uh, infrastructure and operating system based stuff they haven't said what they're talking about it could be i mean my hope would be for some sort of uh upgrade to the friends codes situation maybe something involving um trophies or achievements of some sort which nintendo haven't really done yet maybe it could be their virtual console so you know being able to port older games onto to the system that would be pretty awesome as well i don't know we'll have to see be interesting Mm -hmm. Hmm. interesting times ahead for sure um, and the last little bit of news that we had, which um, sort of ties in directly with the other big topic we're going to talk about tonight, is uh, relating to the Checkpoint um, sort of uh, miniseries, which is going to be releasing real soon. So what did you think of the trailer that they posted for this thing? Um, it looks really cool. I like what they're doing with it. The series will be available from, when was it? January 29th, with an episode on Mondays and Thursdays on YouTube and Steam, actually, interestingly enough, which is really cool. I've never watched anything um, on Steam like that before. I know that it can do it, but... Um, yeah, no, yeah. neither. I didn't even know it was a thing it could do, to be honest, hmm. so... They have anime. Do they? Yeah. What anime would oh. you get on Steam? Hmm, interesting. I just learned something. I'm going to have to look this up now. All right, anyway, continue. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's a series that is focusing on various mental health issues via the power of video games. Mm-hmm. So I personally am very intrigued with it because it's meant to be about improving well-being, boosting resilience, and teaching how games can be used for good, which is a nice positive spin because there's a lot of media about games are bad. This game, it killed people. This person spent five years with this one game and yeah. such and so forth as opposed to, hey, this game taught you know some good mathematics and this one brought out creativity and this one's helping people with these style of disorders. Mm. So... I like the positive outlook it's got. I'm a big fan. Yeah, absolutely. It's also cool that they've got a lot of um, sort of notable industry personalities involved with it as well. So you'll see quite a few familiar names pop up if you follow different um, different uh, companies out there. But yeah, it's um, there's a lot of good stuff around uh, gaming disorders and mental health and that kind of thing on the Checkpoint uh, site. They've got a, a bunch of different blog entries on different topics, so well worth checking that out, which is at, uh, I'm just going to check it. It's at Checkpoint. I'm going to check. It's at checkpoint.org.au. So um, mm-hmm. if you haven't had a look, you can check that out and all their uh, video stuff. Um, you can search on YouTube now. I believe the, the trailer is up there as well. So yeah. Yes, it is. It's awesome. But uh, that leads us really, really neatly over to something we were going to talk about tonight. So, Jam, yes. what are we doing? Yes. So, tonight we wanted to talk in a little more detail. I know, we, I believe we mentioned it last week mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. about the World Health Organization's recent classification, draft classification of gaming disorder. Because uh, it's hit, you know, all of the uh, gaming journalist sites. Everyone's touched on it. I've seen some mainstream sites discuss the fact that it's now got a draft classification. Mm. Um, so it's capturing a lot of people's attention and getting some interest and some talking going. And we wanted to have a look at it for ourselves and with our relatively uneducated, relatively. non-medical professional <laughs> we don't know shit. backgrounds, um, just discuss our impressions of uh, what, what it means or where it's at and, and what our hopes are relating to it. So essentially, um, every few years, I believe, the WHO or the World Health Organization, they revise the international classification of diseases. Mm-hmm. And one of the first stages in doing this is releasing a draft for you know, public consultation. And so when they re- released this one recently, which was ICD-11, um, it included gaming disorder at 671. Um, and it's the first time that this has ever been classified by WHO. And it is just a classification at this stage. Um, So it provided a definition of the grounds under which uh, this disorder might be recognisable. And it is just a draft and it is early stages. So to start with, I guess, should I start reading through the definition for us to talk about? Yeah, yeah. That gives us good framework. Yeah. So, So it's listed as a subsection under disorders due to addictive behaviours. Uh, and it says, gaming disorders characterized by a pattern of persistent or recurrent gaming behavior, be it digital gaming or video gaming, uh, which may be online or offline. 
I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Um, and then it talks about the manifestation and it's got three categories, which I think we could sort of discuss one by one, probably. Yeah. The first being impaired control over gaming. Um, and it lists examples such as onset, frequency, intensity, duration, termination, and context. It makes sense. There's no measurements associated. This is just a loose draft of a classification. But I think those are reasonable grounds. I can't think of any other aspect of gaming that would give rise to concern. That seems fairly consistent with sort of the general opinion yeah. on what might um, classify gaming disorder. Yeah. But, yeah, impaired control, that's an interesting one. Like you feel compelled Pretty to do the act as opposed to being able to stop yourself. Like it's a yeah, compulsion. Yeah, yeah. Just l losing reasonable judgment mm, mm. Um, would be how I'd interpret that. Yeah, like an addict um, needing their hit almost. <laughs> yeah. The second uh, point is manifested by increasing priority given to gaming to the extent that gaming takes precedence over other life interests and daily activities. And, I mean, that's... <laughs> you know, it would be a matter of degree because I know very occasionally I've discovered that it's been a couple of hours since I probably should have had, you know, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but this would be more of a sustained thing, which it gets into later below. But that makes sense too. I mean, it's concerning when your behaviour is overriding standard daily activities that you expect to perform to, to look after yourself healthily. Yeah. And the third point is continuation or escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences. And that one I find really interesting. I think the previous and one think, links to that pretty strongly as well. Yeah. yeah. And it's important. And it's not just necessarily, it doesn't even specify here whether those negative consequences are in-game or out-of-game. I know if I'm having a bit of a gaming binge and something goes wrong in a game, I can quite easily just switch it off and say, nope, that's enough. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, to sort of, I don't know, keep going when it's repeatedly kicking you in the butt, that's a worry. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when those negative consequences are part of your daily life, your real life, yeah. that would definitely be concerning. Because that I, can be stuff like work and school, that sort of thing as well. Yeah. Relationships with, you know, your wife or if you, you're or a parent and yeah. others. you have responsibilities yeah. so, to take care of your kids and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it elaborates on that further below. Um, the behavior pattern is of sufficient severity to result in significant impairment in personal, family, social, educational, occupational or other important areas of functioning. It can be continuous or episodic and recurrent. And it's normally evident over at least 12 months um, in order for a diagnosis to be made. So, you know, that's, that's pretty substantial. Hmm. And I think it's a first step in categorizing this to help people get help. But yeah. I'm glad it's happened. So a lot of people were immediately up in arms when this was announced thinking, oh, you know, you're, you're vilifying gaming. You know, gaming's not so bad, blah, blah, blah. But the context is really important because this is about... An addictive disorder, it's not saying gaming is bad. Yeah. We tend it's to work backwards with these things, though. Like, the, the reason why the conversation yeah. starts in the first place is because we see, like, reports in the media of negative consequences of gaming, and we people don't tend exactly. to realise that sometimes that is actually due to a disorder rather than people just being dumb shits and doing stuff they shouldn't exactly. do. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. And gamers themselves have a, can have a knee-jerk reaction and react poorly and make things worse. Yeah. <laughs> not by the internet, Jen. Surely arms. not. It's certainly um, not the same conversation, but it reminds me a little bit of the times in the past where we've had like a, a game that's been in the press for being like, you know, really violent and then a violent act has occurred. And then all yeah. of a sudden, as a result of that, all gaming is bad. You know, exactly. that's, that's the impact if this is discussed, you know, inappropriately or incorrectly with people who aren't informed about, you know, some of the medical issues going on. Yeah. yeah. So the important part of this definition is that it is categorized below the heading disorders due to addictive behaviors. Mm. So it's the addictive disorder itself. There's an overarching addiction issue ongoing and that gaming is, is the mechanism by which it's manifesting. It's not saying gaming is bad. It's saying that there's a subset of the population with addictive disorders and their crutch may be gaming. Mm. Yeah. And then all of these issues start becoming prevalent because of the underlying addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, even the definition of addiction is 
and this is the literal definition, is a brain disorder characterized by compulsive engagement in rewarding stimuli, in this case gaming, despite adverse consequences. Mm. Yeah. That and is the very, definition of addiction. A very telling point is that right above gaming disorder in this draft, um, beta draft classification document is a definition for gambling disorder. And it is word for word identical with gaming replaced by the word gambling. Yeah. That's because the underlying issue is an addictive disorder. It's just the mechanism by which it's manifesting itself is shifting from gaming to gambling. I tend, or vice to, be- versa. I tend to believe that the reason why gaming is the thing in the conversation now is because the vice in question tends to be a product of our time. So, oh, you know, yeah. looking back, you know, a few decades ago, the, the main sources of entertainment for people when we didn't have this le- level of technology available were things like, you know, drinking and gambling and, you know, probably sex, you know, to a different extent. <laughs> and people with addictive disorders back in those times would have been drawn towards different kinds of vices to what we have now. But these yeah. days, a lot of it is to do with stimulation and, uh, you know, things that trigger you socially and, you know, technology is a huge part of that. Rewarding so. behaviours and that sort of thing, yeah. Mm. And the, the problem or, or the interesting thing about gaming disorder too is that it affects such a huge proportion of the population. It's widely enjoyed by all and it doesn't in and of itself have a lot of negative consequences. There are a lot of positive consequences out of gaming that have been established by studies Hmm. um, about, you know, improving cognitive functions um, for certain game types and all of those bits and pieces which have been discussed elsewhere. Um, They're enjoyable, they're fun, they can be great social mechanisms, all of that stuff. It's not as clear cut as, you know, say substance abuse or alcohol abuse where those products have inherent health risks themselves. Yeah. So I I can see why that would be concerning to people who aren't familiar because you've got this fun form of entertainment and suddenly there's an implication that it might be making people sick. That's not the implication at all, Mm -hmm. but it can easily be uh, misunderstood or perceived that way. I wonder but, if, because um, it, it's something that's equally big in, you know, the public eye in terms of hobbies and, and interests and that kind of thing, and it's still a product of our times. I wonder if anyone has ever attempted a study of like a sporting addiction in the form of um, it being an entertainment sort of type. Not necessarily people who are actually playing sports, but people who are such fervent fans? followers or fans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The same sort of thing Possibly. would apply. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. The psychology of football fans and... <laughs> I also mean soccer for those that don't realise what I'm talking about, <laughs> is actually a well documented thing. Yeah. It would have some there, pretty there is a definite relations. psychology behind that. Mm. And see again, the the focus though, when you think of, you know, a- addictive issues related to, to sports, people tend to go to the gambling and probably focus or think first of the gambling and don't think of the consumption of the sport as a form of entertainment. Yeah. Have you heard um, of a place called England? Yes, <laughs> but gaming differs in this respect because gaming is accessible all the time. Mm. Yeah, Every hour of the day, you can potentially be video gaming, yeah. and that's a risk. If you, ha- if you are a huge Manchester United fan, there's only so much content that you can consume yeah, live, exactly. for example. I'm sure you can re-watch old reels. <laughs> and get angry um, about those as well. Yeah, but it's old news, whereas... Yeah. A gaming experience, there's always a new gaming experience around the corner every second of the day. So, oh, no, exactly. Yeah. So, so it's, a, it's a concern and, and, you know, there are people worried and I'm trying to carefully read the articles without bias to see if they've got any bias. Uh, so far, everything I've read has been quite reasonable. Yeah. Which is, which is really positive. And it's just explaining that, hey, you know, this is a draft classification. For the very first time, this internationally recognised health organisation is uh, trying to get this on the book because once it's on the book, it will open a lot of options. Yeah. But I just thought it's it's fascinating that it has the identical wording to gambling addiction. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think that really does demonstrate that the underlying issue is an addictive disorder with a different Not the product itself. Mm. Yeah. There's yeah. there's no information yet and it's because this is this is the first step in them addressing the issue. There's no uh, information about what they recognize to be the prevalence of the issue in the population. 
whether it might be geographical or related to, you know, different um, economic type communities. I'm sure there's going to be all sorts of stuff spewing forth from this, but the classification in and of itself, I think it's fair and reasonable and and the best possible starting point to help people who do have this addictive disorder get help. It and re- it's a real positive step. It's not a negative step. It's not labelling gaming is bad. No, but I, I think we do need Very to recognise that it's a double-edged sword of a topic too. Like if people are oh, 100%. not careful... There can be a lot of conversation that enters into this that is ill-informed, you know, linking to areas that are not related to mental health. You know, pe- as soon as people start talking in terms of the gambling conversation and then, you know, things that have been big themes throughout 2017, such as, you know, um, yep. loot boxes in games and all that sort of stuff, this is not the same thing. This is, you know, we're, we're talking about people who have an inherent problem here and how it manifests is going to be different depending on what's available. But, you know, loot boxes do not cause gaming disorders. They are something that, you know, are linked to it by a conversation and probably misinterpreted because of their existence. But this is something that's much more serious and much more, you know, Im- embedded in the people um, who are affected as opposed to the games that they play. That's that's the core here. So, yeah. yeah. So there's also a definition um, for behaviour related to the disorder or leading from the disorder called hazardous gaming. Mm. And that's Mm. where it's appreciably increasing the risk of harmful physical or mental health consequences to the individual or those around them. And we've seen instances of this where it gets to the point where, you know, a a 40-hour binge has left someone in a coma or incredibly sick, possibly even, you know, they've passed away because they've neglected their health or the health of someone else to the point of, you know, life consequence like substantial consequence and and that's a huge concern Mm. so it's important these discussions take place so that those things can be addressed but the discussions have to be reasoned everyone just has to be careful not to be too speculative and also not too extreme in their way of thinking about the issue because you, it's, you can't apply any one definition to any other. I don't think there's ever going to be any hard and fast measurements for this equals a, an addict, a gaming addict. It's going to be all based on personal preference, you know, how an individual behaves with their, with their gaming. Absolutely. I mean, not to be flippant, but I, I look at a lot of the different aspects of, you know, the addictive personalities linked to gaming. And almost looking off the checklist, I, I kind of look at that and go, okay, at some point in time of my life, I could maybe fit into a few of these. <laughs> I think oh, to myself, yeah. Yeah, does that mean I've got a, you know, an addictive personality? And the reality <laughs> is, to a smaller extent, I probably do. <laughs> but you know, this is a, well, a level a beyond that. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's- and that's the thing. We all have aspects of that. Like, it's when it's taken to an extreme. Like, yeah. we all like getting a, a positive stimuli that's built in, that's hardwired into us. Yeah. It's when it's hardwired that we then disregard other things purely for that that's when it becomes Hmm. the issue and it's over a sustained period of time too it's got to be it's usually persistent and it typically may escalate yeah and it significantly impacts your life i think you also have an impairment you have to draw a line between adult and irresponsible teenager in these sorts of cases too like there's a there's a certain learning that comes with that level of maturity that relates to this that if you're yeah. still doing these kinds of things when you are a responsible, mature adult, then that's much more indicative of a disorder. Yeah. Well, mm. again, it's, said, it's all a matter of degree, though. Yeah. Exactly. Even though you might be an irresponsible teenager, you can still have gaming addiction. Mm. Mm. For and sure. so the education does need to start earlier on. Yeah. Because in that regard, it's no different to, say, alcohol or drug abuse in that regards, in that we you are educated about that. Mm. Mm. Like... Yes, you might still try as a teenager and you might experiment and whatnot, but then to get an addiction in those early years is indicative of something else entirely. And so you need that same level of education in regards to gaming disorder and having that in the public perception will help that because you need it to be education. Like education is the key to anything. And so now it's in public eye, you people, parents will then have a look and go, huh, okay, pay a little bit more attention, hopefully, if they weren't already. And then you you have that flow on effect in that if this is a draft goes through everything like that and then it becomes a formalized thing with set criteria and all that and whatnot then you have this education that will then flow through and hopefully 
Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Mid- I've gone blank. Mitigate. Mitigate. That'll yeah. work. Yeah. Mitigate some support. of the harmful factors. Yeah, or support. Yeah, just support the the recognition, awareness, and further discussion. It's like recognition any mental was health. The word I was looking for. Yeah, <laughs> it's like any mental health issue. It's something we can't be afraid of talking about, but we have to talk about it respectfully. Yeah. Mm. And internationally, the first step is having who recognise this and mm. define this, and it's a very positive step mm. because yeah. it does affect people quite severely. Not a lot of people, but the severity means that they deserve to have answers, science behind it, treatment options, an understanding of, you know, how and why this is happening and who they can go to for help, mm. yeah. um, which is very positive. And it's a little different to the discussion on gambling in video games too. But, you know, when they're combined together, that could be a more potent mix for some yeah, who are particularly compelling. susceptible to gambling addiction and gaming addiction. That's the thing. If it's an addictive personality disorder, well, then it doesn't matter whether it's gambling via computer game or the or com- game in general, I should say. So when yeah. you compound those two together, it's just fuel on the fire, basically. Yeah, And, and so, with yeah. the prevalence of loot boxes recently as well. Certain games are much more susceptible to that kind of you know behavior linking into it as well. I mean, we're talking about the games that have a, a continual loop that you'll be playing them, you know, end on um, end to to sort of you know progress in over time rather than you know finite contained experiences. Um, mm. Talking about things that do have those re- rewards built in, um, you know, whether it's a loot box or an achievement or any of anything of that shape, you or know, or a win, or a win, a, yeah, a, com- what, whatever. a competitive game where you get a win over a, a real life opponent, a, yeah. another human. Some, 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 um, something that causes that pleasure center of your brain, you know, that dopamine hit to, to you know, give you a buzz. All, all that stuff is, is a bit risky for, for the people who are afflicted. But, um, Jam, you said something earlier when we were talking about this um, just, just before we began the show tonight, which really sort of stuck with me. And that's that when we're talking about levels of risk here, and one, one of the things I guess I'm most fearful about uh, in terms of the level of ignorance out there is um, particularly with regards to, to younger people and children. Yes, yeah, and yes. something you said um, which I thought was great was that th- this is something that, um, you know, all of the other vices we could be talking about when it comes to gambling or alcohol or any of that stuff, generally speaking, none of that's a, a sort of uh, accessible by kids. Gaming yeah, so 100% is. Mm. That's, that's why it's such a hot topic. That's why there can be such a knee-jerk reaction from anyone involved in being responsible for children. Uh, so far... To the best of my knowledge, every other addictive disorder has related to a substance or an activity that's really only accessible by adults. Mm. And they're regulated to a pretty decent degree to the point where, you know, people usually have to, I guess, be a little deceptive in order to um, get their fix, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. The reason that gaming disorder is so difficult to talk about and so necessary to talk about is because of the kids. So you, you'll have children who may have an addictive disorder and ordinarily it would likely, pre-video games, um, have been very hard to diagnose, to recognise, to manifest mm. until adulthood. Yeah. Unless you're paying careful attention, I'm sure there would be ways to, to recognise it. But with the advent of video games and the accessibility in this day and age particularly for young kids, it's... I guess it's a lot easier for it to manifest early, which is an added concern for parents. Um, And because of the relationship to video games, you know, there's this correlation there, which isn't causation, but which people can misinterpret that, that the games are, you know, making their kids sick. Yeah. Um, But not only that, there's, there's a fear. It's scary. If, If your child is exhibiting, you know, scary behaviours, whatever they may be, or concerning behaviours to the point where they're um, not showing control or it's affecting, you know, their health or their lifestyle. I mean, you'd freak out as a parent because that's just awful. The whole not showing control thing's a lot harder to pick up on with kids as well because usually oh, absolutely. Their, their control mechanism is the parent. I mean, the, the amount of yep. exposure they have to these things is always going to be modulated and, and limited by an authority figure in their, their orbit. It's not something that, you know, you can work out that a kid's addicted to a particular type of uh, activity because they, you know, do it all the time because usually they're not yep. going to have the option. 
But exactly. The thing, that's- that, the thing that scares me is just that the number of parents out there that are so ill-informed about this kind of thing in general, though, like it's this, this is a very, very new focus for, you know, a younger audience and, you know, one that we haven't really had in the conversation before because all the other stuff is very much linked to adulthood. But like the same sort of people that I endlessly see, like just, just to paint a picture, and this isn't the same situation by any stretch, but this is the kind of level of understanding that your lay, lay person has in, you know, a parenting um, sort of, you know, situation. I, I'm often in conversations with other parents about sort of, you know, what level of entertainment they let their kids be exposed to. And these are the sorts of people we're dealing with here who would sort of let their kids sit down for three hours straight and watch a TV show, but they think that it's bad to do the same thing, same level of gaming even for an hour or two. And I'm just yeah. like, do you understand that there's you know not a huge amount of difference there when we're talking about screen time except for the fact that one is interactive and one is not? Th- but it's that level of, of ignorance that concerns me. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's... Yeah. And that's- that's the really important thing to come out of all of this. You've got uh, these young people who are in a, a formulative age where they're learning how to control their behaviours. Mm. Um, they're learning a whole lot of different things. Um, you can't be blasé about it. And I'm not a parent, <laughs> like straight up. Ditto. But this is my opinion. He, you've got to... Educate yourself. The problem is um, there hasn't been a lot of reliable sources of information Mm -hmm. to this point. This classification, this draft classification is the first step and it's excellent because from here what we're hoping is for a a published definition, a scope of the issue so people understand what degree they're talking about when flags should start getting raised. Studies looking at all ages – uh, to help and all understand, game types as well. Yep, and all game types to help understand the prevalence and perhaps the causes, um, the, the key things to look for. Um, and from their treatment options, there are a lot of uh, treatment options available. There are clinics in some parts of the world, but there hasn't been a lot happening to help them uh, develop their strategies. This is the first step to really starting an international movement to help people understand this, the most important thing that's going to come out of it is the messaging, the communication with the public. It needs to be clear about what the disorder is, that it is an addiction issue inherent in the individual and that, you know, gaming is a crutch but not a cause. Hmm. Um, It needs to recognise you know, yeah, you've got a young kid, you've got a child or a teenager who's gaming a bunch. That doesn't necessarily mean they're addicted. That means they're a kid. Um, but if this and this and this you recognise, then start a conversation with them. Here's how you can have that conversation. Or talk to your health professional and here are the things you can talk about and what you might be able to do. You know, all of this... It needs to come from a place not of fear but of constructive support and really informed conversation, which is why I'm so happy that this is getting defined for the first time because having such a well-respected international health organisation tackling it, um, they're going to have the resources to start really (laughs) gathering the data and sorting, you know, the wheat from the chaff because there are so many studies, so many studies that some people will, you know, um, hold up as the definitive whatever and others will say, no, no, it wasn't done properly, you know, there's not enough sample size or um, it hasn't been replicated enough. It's it's the first step in starting all of this, in pushing all of this. So that's why I'm just it's, – it's positive and people need to talk about this positively. And I'm worried that's not going to happen in some uh, audiences. I think that's a legitimate concern, <laughs> yeah. for sure. So, Ollie, you've got a bit of bit more of a background in your, your sort of daily job stuff with regards to psychology, possibly relating to this kind of thing. I mean, did you pick up anything from the the findings on the report that sort of spoke to you as um, interesting and worth noting? Well, the biggest thing for me is with children and teenagers. So, formative behaviour, the routines that you develop, um, both as a child and as a teenager into an adult is mostly based off positive reinforcement. Yeah. And it's how you train a dog. It's how you train a kid. 
they're, it's the same mechanism. Negative connotations and negative punishment, yes, it works every now and then, but positive reinforcement gives you a longer-lasting impression and it works much more effectively. And so when you have a game giving you positive affirmations and positive reinforcement, you're going to latch on to that. Hmm. And that's going to become your formative behavior because you're going, yes, I did this thing right, tick, get a reward, fantastic. And as a kid, no matter how young you are or how old you are, that's a positive thing. That's then you're learning that behavior. And when it then comes as a detriment to other facets, it's not out of like a malicious thing. It's literally because they don't know any better because that other formative behavior hasn't had a chance to develop. Mm. And so they're getting all these positive things from the games when they don't necessarily have positive things from, say, I don't know, doing their chores properly or getting their homework done on time or visiting Timmy down at the park or whatever because those formative behaviors and the positive connotations of them haven't been developed because the gaming one is easier to achieve and is more accessible. Hmm. And that's the biggest thing. Gaming is designed for you to achieve. Yes, I know Dark Souls exists. Sue me. Hmm. Um, (laughs) But the fact is that we like those games. We go, yes, I got a positive affirmation from beating it as this is supposed to be a hard game. Fuck yeah, look at me. And it doesn't matter if it's that style of game or literally just this little clicky game where you sit there bashing a screen and coins fall down in the hundreds <laughs> and you go, cool, what do I get? I get an upgrade to drop more coins down. I'll keep clicking. Yay, positive affirmation. Hmm. And so when you apply that to a young f- brain that's still forming its behaviors and its concepts, that's where it needs to be really careful. And it all hmm. comes down to parent involvement. Absolutely. That's all what it is. It's parent understanding and parent involvement. Because at the end of the day, that kid does not know better. We can say, yes, let's educate them. But at the end of the day, legally, they are not responsible. <laughs> the parent is. Hmm. And so it comes down to educating the parents. And like Jam said, it can't be one of games are bad. No games ever. Violence in games will make your kid into a serial killer. Nothing like that. It should be take an interest in what your kid is doing. Don't plonk them for four hours on an iPad. Yeah. Um, actually hmm. see what they're doing. Interact with them. Are they interacting with other people while they're doing it? Is it school friends? Is it siblings? Like, how are you approaching it? Is it a family bonding time? Is it time for them to chill out if they had a hard day or whatever? Hmm. Yeah, like, interaction with the parent is should be the number one thing. And if that's the case, education of the parent should be the number one thing. Agreed. Is your child sitting down and watching GTA 5 clips on YouTube showing you how to kill hookers? Then you may have a problem. You may need to <laughs> well, get Well, not even involved. that. Like, <laughs> knowing what channel your kid is watching. So, a great example. Um, if they watch, say, name a famous Minecrafter for me, Luke. Uh, Dan the Diamond Minecart. Okay. Is he very GPG? Uh, yeah. Like he's child-friendly, right? He's yeah. certified child-friendly for Absolutely. YouTube. Yeah. So, how would you know, as an uninformed parent, the difference between one of his videos and one of, say, a Rooster Teeth's Achievement Hunter? Uh, well, I mean, obviously we're Without a special case it. because we're involved in If your in kid this had headphones on. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's very Which difficult. is the common thing. Yeah. Headphones are common now yeah. because parents don't want to listen to their kid's stuff. Yeah. So, how can you tell the difference between that, for example? Hmm. And so, yeah, it needs to come down to parent education. And having this come out abroad as a officially, like, internationally recognized thing hmm. is a huge step for that. Mm. Yeah. No, I agree. I think one of the, one of the things too that is is going to be coming up in conversation more and more as this progresses as a uh, an awareness piece is that while we're we're sort of getting a lot more on board with identifying that there is an issue and and you know some of the aspects of that issue, solution mode is still something that we're very much missing at the present time. So there's not yeah. a lot of uh, you know guidance on on how this should be treated or addressed with individuals like at the moment it's very much down to you know the individuals to address you know with with their healthcare professionals and and sort of deal with as you know mental health issues have been dealt with in the past there's nothing specific to like a gaming type of disorder that has sort of been called out as being a, a good um you know mitigation or preventative method for for sort of isolating are, and dealing with it there are niche organizations that have have suggested uh treatment methodologies there are some clinics in certain parts of the world, to the best of my knowledge, none of that is backed up by, you know, an, a recognition, uh, an organisation mm. such as WHO recognising the treatment strategy because they're not there yet. They're here at step yep. one. But 
that doesn't mean there isn't help out there. That doesn't mean you can't consult with a health professional about addiction Mm. and understand what resources are available to you if you're concerned that someone, anyone near you, be it child or adult, um, might have an issue um, Mm. or might be demonstrating these behaviours. And to give a bit of perspective, gambling addiction, which has been around for a long time, and has been not necessarily maybe World Health Organization recognized, but recognized by the psychological community and the health community in general. Mm. And governments. There is, mm. yeah, there is no permanent cure for that. And there won't be a permanent cure for gaming addiction either. The only thing you can do is manage it. You can tr- attempt to control it. Mm. And that's it. So as far as treatment is concerned, I think it will fall very similar in lines with um, how gambling addiction Mm. And to a very small extent, small, small extent, substance abuse things as well. Because at the end of the day, it is a physical thing that is giving you that response in which, whether it's an iPhone, whether it's an Xbox controller, whatever, um, it's still a physical medium. Um, And then the gambling thing as well, because it's not a reliance, you're not requiring certain chemicals to be injected into your bloodstream, I think it will be treated similar in that regards to gambling in that it'll just be a control and management side of thing rather than a yeah you're it's fixed your forever behavior. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely because mm. yeah some of it does come down to environmental and some of it does just come down to genetics as well there's been a few studies and the answer is yes so yeah there's no hard and fast when it comes to mental disorders unfortunately mm-hmm so what about mental disorders that force you to make puns all the time? There's got to be something classified at who for that, right? I've given up. <laughs> I mean, there's one option only, and it's to never speak again. Oh, fuck. <laughs> there's, there's elective surgery to have your vocal cords removed. It's kind of like a verbal Ooh. vasectomy. No, oh, my God. You see how this works Why? is that if I don't exercise my mouth to, you know, tell shitty jokes all the time, my mouth actually heals over and it's just solid skin again, so it's pre- preventative. Not saying a negative. <laughs> Prove it. <laughs> oh Jesus! Yeah. Scientific theory and yeah. all that. I want to. I want to see the evidence it mm-hmm. multiple times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. basically, so gaming disorder—it's a thing. It's becoming internationally recognised. It affects a select proportion of the population, and it's a problem. But the vast majority of the population are good. Yeah. <laughs> Even if we sound like we're playing games way too much, we're very good at the end of the day, knowing when we should switch I'm on off holidays. The computer. I'm allowed to. <laughs> Yes. Well, you know, special occasions. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it becomes, I think, it's it's easier probably to recognise it in an adult who has to balance responsibilities because, you know, no one's paying my bills while I video game. So mm-hmm. <laughs> i got to make sure I get that streaming. sorted myself. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, but we love games. The games are so beneficial in so many ways. Um, you just have to, it, it's all about balance. Yeah. Everything in moderation. Um, happy, healthy life. And there's still a big gap out there between people with a genuine disorder and shit humans, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. God, what? Uh, uh, you know, people who do the wrong thing actively by choice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Like you. Yeah. Yes. But like yeah, you. this this is a positive step. <laughs> Unlawed. If, if you get in a conversation with anyone about it, try and talk about it from a positive, constructive viewpoint and help us try to allay the concern that... There's a causation yeah. there with video games. Video games aren't causing this issue. This is an illness in some people yeah. that just manifests through video games. And it's unfortunate. And we want them to get all of the help that they can get. So this is a wonderful first step. Yeah, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Agreed. Check out Checkpoint. They've got a big article on all this stuff. It's a good one. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. You should have a read. There's actually a, uh, a big blog post on gaming disorder you know, what does it actually mean, Um, which goes into a lot of detail about uh, the recent findings of uh, the World Health Organization and uh, a bunch of the stuff that we've talked about tonight as well. So what you need to know, you can you can have a look at that. And uh, yeah, while you're there, you might want to check out the video series that we mentioned during the the news earlier on, because there's a bunch of stuff that kind of ties in together. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Everybody look after yourself and look after your mental health as well as your physical health. Mm -hmm. Everyone deserves to be happy and enjoy video games. And enjoy life. And hey, if you look after yourself and you're happy and healthy, you can game more because you're healthy. 
<laughs> exactly. That's how this works, huh? right? That's, that's, that's my mythology. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, funny. Uh, okay, it's getting late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is getting silly, I All think. All right, we'll end it there. <laughs> Cool. Anyway, that, that was a good discussion. There's a lot of tricky sort of yeah. aspects to that. It's but, difficult um, to talk about. Yeah. Um, and, and it's easy to imply the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, but if we're all keeping an open mind and being reasonable and making allowances for people, you know, talking about these issues for the first time, then we can have some really good conversations. So we're all keeping an open mind and being reasonable. See, Imogen, you're not here for one week and this is already what we've become. Holy shit. <laughs> now, if the rest of the Did internet could cotton on, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, great. Well, thank you for bearing with us. If you've uh, just gotten through that big discussion, hopefully, you've, hopefully you found something interesting and useful out of that. But if uh, you want to find out more, we've already pointed you to a couple of good resources. But if you've got some comments for us, you can also let us know directly. So, Ollie, where can people go to drop us a line and chat about all things gaming disorders? Well, they can find us at the following things, Luke. They can find us at mail at pyloaded.com, Facebook. Party Loaded. Twitter, at Party Loaded Show. And on YouTube, it's youtube.com slash channel end game. Those are our contact deets. Nice. And, uh, yeah. Um, we um, tend to probably get most of our correspondence via Twitter and Facebook these days, but, uh, yeah, quick, anything quick. is fine. Anything is fine. All right, well, that brings us to the end of uh, another week's episode. Um, prepping for, for next week, what have you guys got on the boil? Anything uh, besides... Defending against billions and billions of zombies, Ollie? What are you going to pick up next in your dwindling holidays? I'm going to punch Moldy Man in the face in Resident Evil DLC. Oh, nice. I thought you'd already finished that. I thought you'd punched it no, last No, no, there's two. There's oh, two. okay, cool, cool. There's one um, where you're a soldier man and there's one where you're a redneck man. I have played the soldier man one. I need to play the redneck man one. Okay, interesting. I just saw that uh, Little Nightmares is on special at the moment for 50% off, so right. I think Ooh. I might grab that. Do it. Mm -hmm. Pull the trigger. Yep. I've heard good things, mostly from you, but I trust that. <laughs> <laughs> my, you love platformers more than I do. Mm -hmm. My focus for the next week is uh, getting over this cold so I can enjoy Foo Fighters on Saturday. <gasps> oh, nice. Yay! But that's not Vidya Games. I oh, know, I'm going outside. <laughs> Everything outside? in moderation, see? <laughs> see? <laughs> I, think, I think you have an outside world disorder, Jam. You feel compelled <laughs> to do something that's against your best interests. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. I'm, I'm getting better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again with uh, more fun and frolicking next week. But for now, ta-ta. Bye. Bye. Look after yourself. The Party Loaded Podcast is a Channel Endgame production. For this and more great gaming content, bookmark channelendgame.com. <laughs>